If you wanted to bring guns into the UK, mm. that'd be very difficult to shift the entire culture of a country to have have guns as part of it. We don't have a constitution like you do have. We don't have that history. So that transition to guns would be yeah. very difficult. And as would in the US a transition away from guns. And I just yeah. think different parts of the world have different cultures. I don't think it's worth getting into the autism of it, but strictly speaking, our gun culture is born of English gun culture and militia culture. You're the cradle for 800 years of what became the American gun culture. It's yeah. just, you know, we diverged pretty rapidly after the 18th century, I guess, once your constitution became imperial and our constitution kind of dwelled in this Whiggish Republican form for a couple hundred years, we went in these very different directions, which happy to talk about, probably not on your on your list today. But, well, you can talk about that. I mean, but, you know, I, for, the, for the people at home when they're like, well, UK doesn't have a gun culture, the UK had an incredible gun culture. All Anglo-American gun culture comes from uh, the proud tradition of British anti-army ideology. Do you know what? I'm going to be honest and embarrassed enough to say, I don't actually know anything about this. All I know is, all I know this is, is what he does best. you had a, <laughs> you had a well-armed militia, it. you had a well-armed militia, you kicked us out. Yeah. And ever since your tea has been yeah. shit. <laughs> Fair enough. You know that. Oh man, if we want to talk about the revolution, yeah. I mean, Let's talk about it. Our, our militias in the, in the colonial period were by royal charter, um, and part of us discovering our revolutionary, you know, conversation was, okay, the the UK with, with its new imperial constitution was treating us not like English citizens or subjects anymore. It was treating us like the Irish, or worse, like the Indians, you know, in India. And we were like, well, aren't we Englishmen too? Why aren't we not just represented, but why are they not renewing our militia charters? And don't we as Englishmen, since the Petition of Right and the Settlement of 1688 and the English Bill of Rights, don't we have the right to keep and bear arms? It's in there, right? Uh, and so this conversation uh, leads Patrick Henry, George Mason, the Virginia delegation, these people to, to reassert these things which they thought they had already assumed as Englishmen by charter and royal privilege and, and this kind of period of benevolence in 1688 and, and royal, I don't know, like a negligence. Uh, led to a, a kind of conversation where we began to reject the 18th century constitution of Great Britain and we embraced a hundred year earlier Whiggish country party interpretation of the, the Gothic English constitution. And our revolution in a sense is a way of writing what we thought the rights of Englishmen were in that century before the revolution. So it's kind of like uh, we just did a remix, a, a redo on what we thought the rights of Englishmen were and we wrote it down. Um, and this kind of affected the entire world and, and the system of written constitutions worldwide. I knew nothing of this. Oh, well, specifically about militias. I mean, we can go on and on, but English republicanism is connected to the earliest republicanism, like in Machiavelli. Uh, and of course, Machiavelli was all about what's the best check on aristocratic and oligarchic power? Individuals or freeholders owning owning arms. So it was a, it was a big part of English republican ideology from the 16th century through the English Civil War, the New Model Army, Cromwell, th this idea that somehow the, the common man represented the popular will, especially when he was armed. Uh, and so the English settlement of like uh, rights and so I don't, I don't mean to pretend to be a professor here or something, but the English settlement of questions of, um, okay, divine right of kings or monarchical privilege versus, you know, parliament's privilege is a, is a way of also de deriving or defining what the rights of Englishmen were. Their settlements stopped with an absolute parliament. But in the, in the American experience, our settlements stopped with something else. We were like, you know what? An absolute parliament is itself despotic. And we came up with this idea of federalism and state rights. And, and we settled the question just one more step away. And we said the militia power doesn't lie with the legislature. It, in fact, lies with the states and the popular militias. And this kind of gave us what became the Second Amendment. Do you think the, I mean, I know that there are certain militias that exist within the sure, U.S. Sure. I've seen... Uh, I can't remember the story about, I wasn't prepared to, we were going to talk about this, but I remember a story <laughs> about a particular place where there was like access rights to a farm. I think it was and, in Nevada, wasn't was it? it Nevada? Oh, the Bunkerville Rebellion. Yeah. yeah the Bundy. Everybody knows about Bundy and yeah. the conflict with the feds. I'll say this first and foremost. The, so legally speaking, our militias have evolved in how our government understands them. So the, uh, the unorganized militia of, let's say, the 18th and 19th century is a different beast uh, than what we call the militia after the Civil War and the rise of the National Guard. And now the federal federal power has two specific bands of people that it recognizes as militia, which is more or less just the National Guard, like liberals will say. And a lot of people will just uh, assert themselves as, as state groups and say, well, we're the militia. And every now and then a state government might recognize that, but usually they don't. Um, and it's it's more of like a an appeal to tradition when somebody like Bundy gets up and asks people to come on out. He's appealing to 
the so-called unorganized militia. More like a band of brothers. Yeah, there's like, um, that was just like a cultural moment, but Americans fell for it and the government fell for it because we do have this tradition of an organized militia or at least this mythical figure of the Minuteman resisting, uh, you know, tyranny or something. But, and I've I've seen it before, instances where there's a group of people who will turn up to the local, correct me if I get this wrong, like state building or capital building with, with their guns. You're thinking of Michigan and Whitmer and the early protests there maybe. Yeah. Yeah, this is common. In fact, in the Texas state capitol, you're allowed to show up armed. Um, a lot of people discovered during COVID there weren't laws against these kinds of things. Um, so, so do you believe in the U.S. you essentially have almost like a, this decentralized militia now that is, if an if it was ever required, would band together? <clears throat> well, or does it meet, need more organization? I now? think there's two parts to your question. So I, I yeah. do think there is this disorganized, unorganized militia, maybe harder emphasis on disorganized, but... And that's simply like the uh, the free citizens of the country who are allowed to keep and bear arms. You know, they're not otherwise barred from from that. They do, I think, in a in a constitutional sense, represent like a, another structural power of government. Um, but the second part of your question is, would they show up? And I don't think we have the type of people that would meaningfully show up, or we would have seen greater action during COVID. I think. 